When I started Hope Fellowship in 2000, I was 33 years old and I had no idea what the future held. I really did not know if I was going to be good enough, experienced enough, or, or even prepared enough for what was ahead. But I was and am forever grateful for all those who believed in me and gave me a shot. And here at Hope Fellowship, we want to be the type of church that, that not only has a place for the next generation, but provides opportunities to the next generation. And if you look around Hope on any given weekend, you'll see middle school and high school students serving our Hope kids, leading worship in 4.5, which is our fourth and fifth grade. And you'll see young people taking part in many leadership roles on and off the stage. So we believe in the next generation. And it is a big part of my heart the last few years to not only be intentional about ministering to the next generation, but to develop and equip them as well. And, and guys, you know this, that's why we've started SCU at Hope. That's our Southeastern University at Hope. That's our college to prepare the next generation of leaders for not just ministry, but all sorts of, of fields of of uh, occupation and hope residency is our staff training uh, for those who feel maybe called to ministry and want to get a little bit more experience and we coach them and, and and our staff just gets younger each year so we truly want to put our money where our mouth is because we believe the future depends on it so today I'm very excited about this. We have something special in line for you. As we finish 2019, I wanted to give the mic to five leaders on our team who are directly involved with either training the next generation or developing the next generation, or they are the next generation. We have our SEU director, a resident, our Seeds of Hope coordinator, a connections pastor, and finally, our lead student pastor. We are calling this weekend Voices because they are the voices of the next generation at Hope. They've been given each five minutes, TED Talk style, so if you've seen that, you know what I'm talking about, to share their heart and inspire us all. I am so proud of all of them, so will you, Hope, across all of our campuses, will you join me in welcoming our first speaker, Director of SCU, Reagan Frizzell. Hey, Hope Fellowship! My name is Reagan Frizzell. Like Pastor John said, I'm the SU at Hope Site Director here at Hope Fellowship, and I'm so excited to be with you today. We have an amazing opportunity right here at Hope Fellowship. We get to partner with Southeastern University out of Lakeland, Florida. We are a fully accredited, affordable university right here at Hope Fellowship. We are a training ground for the next generation. We have degrees in business, ministry, leadership, organizational leadership, digital media and design psychology. Is that not incredible? We have students in our program in all stages and ages of life. We have full-time working moms who are getting their degree in business. We have business owners getting more resources in our organizational leadership degree. And we have traditional students right out of high school. Give me a shout out, SEU at Home student right there. Training, getting hands-on ministry experience training across all four of our campuses. And then they get to do the ministerial leadership degree. How cool is that? Are you, is it just me? Or I'm just so pumped. Oh my goodness. I'm so excited. I remember the very first time I felt called to the next generation. I was a sophomore in college and I decided one summer that it might be smart if I spent a summer with teenagers at a camp called Teen Adventure. The last week of that camp, we were going to whitewater raft down a river and we were going to have to be the guides. Hold on. So we invested all summer in these students. We were just pouring in and just loving on them. And we, the, the last week of the summer came and we get to the camp. We get to the river. 
we put our boats in and we put our students in the boats and we start rafting. I'm thinking, this is a great way to cap the end of a long summer with these crazy teenagers. And so it's all calm and it feels like vacation and it's amazing and we're just paddling. And then off in the distance, I start hearing splashes and screaming. And I'm thinking, oh dear God, what am I gonna do? So I just kind of back paddle and, and then up paddles my kayak guide, okay? So he barrels into my boat and he's like, listen to me, down the river, there's a rock. It's huge. It's off to the left. I want you to aim your boat to that rock. I want you to get all your students to the very front of your boat. And I want you to paddle as hard as you can. And I want you to hit that rock head on. And I'm, I'm thinking, you gotta be kidding me. You gotta be kidding me. So um, I'm, I'm staring at him and he said, when you do, the current is gonna take you backwards down the fall. If you fail to hit the rock, your boat, the current, the pressure of the current is gonna take you sideways and you're gonna flip like all five boats ahead of you. And I'm thinking, oh my God, you know I'm, a, I'm looking at him, he's burly, he's just like, he's got his helmet on and I'm, and I'm like, you know I'm a sophomore in college, right? There's no way. I got, I've got a karate kid guy who's been all summer, he's acting like a samurai Jedi guy. And he's just been like karate chopping the air. And he was doing it at the very front of my boat. And I was thinking, there's no way we're going to make it down this river. And I was just freaking out. And then something came over me. It could have been the ice cold freezing water. But I was like, I'm not flipping this boat. I am not gonna, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lose not one student either. So I just like got them all bared on. I was like, listen, we are gonna do exactly what that kayak guide said. We are gonna paddle so hard and we are gonna aim our boat directly at that rock and we're gonna hit it. And so we did, we just started paddling and the karate guy, he's just paddling and we're just, we're going, we hit the rock head on. Sure enough, we go halfway, we turn, we turn backwards and we go down the river the fall, the waterfall backwards, it's just like the Titanic. We're just like, there's like bodies everywhere and boats turned over. And I'm just like, I'm rocky at that moment. I'm like, yeah, this is amazing. All of us were like, the karate guy, he's like, yes, we made it. He just bows to me. I'm just like, you guys, it was an incredible summer. The river taught me three things that summer. It taught me to do it afraid, number one. Lead afraid, inspire anyway, regardless of how you feel. Secondly, it taught me do difficult things, do hard things, aim at the rocks in life, face situations head on. And thirdly, and most importantly, it taught me to trust my guide. Trust God in all situations. My guide, he knew the river better than I was and he was way more skilled than I was ever gonna be. So it'd be foolish of me to not listen to him, right? This is, this is essentially what we get to do here at Hesse at Hope. We get to navigate rough waters with students. We get to create an environment in a boat. For, we get to put a paddle in their hand, aka a Bible, a professor, be up close to them and champion them and help them know what a win looks like. I love this scripture that says, it's Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. I am so honored to champion the next generation here at Hope Fellowship. I tell the students often, it's not necessarily the degree that's gonna matter the most in life, it's who you are becoming in the process. And Hope Fellowship, we get to be a part of that becoming, and I couldn't be more honored. Thank you so much. Hello, Hope Fellowship. Thank you. Uh, my name is Nate Stuckey. I'm the Connections and Grow resident here at the Frisco East Campus. Uh, and a little bit of what that means, I'm one of seven residents uh, scattered across all the different campuses, uh, working in a lot of different departments. But, but my two that I get to work in is our Connections Department. Uh, so you've probably heard it said here a hundred times, if people matter to God, they should matter to us. Uh, and we believe that. And in Connections, we get to kind of live that out on the front lines. We get to be the first impression uh, for new people as they come in. And, and we want to show them that, that you matter. 
and that we love you and that God loves you. And so I love that. Uh, also get to be involved in our grow ministry, which is all of our spiritual growth uh, curriculum, Bible studies classes. We get to uh, prepare that to help people learn more about the Bible, uh, learn more about Jesus and, and also find community. And so uh, I'm so thankful and honored that I get to be a part of those things. Uh, I'm, I'm just grateful to be at a church like this with so many amazing people, including all of you. Uh, so today, I want to look at a question. I want to look at a question that, that I think a lot of us in this room maybe have, have come across in our life, and hopefully I want to answer that. And, and it kind of sounds like this. Uh, what do we do whenever we feel like we can't? What do we do when we come to a place uh, where we just we feel like we can't do it, where our ability, our knowledge, uh, whatever we have, it's not enough, and, and we just feel like we can't do it? What do we do? Well, I want to start by telling you a little bit about my story. Uh, I actually graduated a couple years ago from a program really similar to SCU. Uh, it was just up in Oklahoma. And while I was there, I studied worship. Uh, I was preparing to be a worship leader. I thought that's what I would do. I've been a musician forever. Uh, love music. Thought that's what I was going to do. Well, as I'm approaching graduation, uh, I just feel like God's leading me in a new direction, and I wasn't sure what that was. And so I fast forward a couple of crazy months. I actually get a job offer uh, to be a youth pastor down in Houston, Texas. I'd never been to Houston. I uh, get this job offer, and it was awesome, except for one thing. I didn't know a thing about youth ministry. I had no clue what I was doing. Uh, in no way was I qualified for this job. But he offered me the job, and I decided to take the job. Um, and at first, it was kind of exciting, but really quickly became really, really overwhelming to me. And I remember kind of going into the season of life where I was up till 2, 3 in the morning some nights just battling these thoughts of, of you're going to fail. Uh, you don't know how to do this. You're a fraud, and, and they're going to be so disappointed that they hired you. And it was really hard. And for months, I remember uh, battling that. But everything kind of changed for me when I met a guy in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Uh, I was down visiting my now in-laws for the first time, also stressful. Um, I was down visiting them, and, and I met this guy at this church, and, and he shared something with me, and it sounded like this. He said, Nate, you know, it's kind of like you're in a practice room throwing darts at a dartboard, preparing for a dart competition. And you're throwing as hard as you can, uh, trying to hit the bullseye, but you're terrible at it. And that's why you're afraid. But what you need to realize, Nate, is it's not actually your job to throw the dart. It's not your job. It's just your job to be the dart. God's the one who throws the dart. And he'll hit the bullseye every time. And when he said that to me, it was one of those moments that, that maybe you've encountered where, where it's almost like God himself just said it because you know it's exactly what you needed to hear. And I realized that was my problem. I was looking at, at my ability and then looking at what needed to be done and saying, I can't do this. And it reminded me of, of Moses in Exodus 3. When God called Moses, he said, I, I want you to go set my people free. I, I want you to go to Pharaoh. And the first words out of Moses' mouth were, who am I that I could do that? I can't do that, is what he said. And God just responded, I'm with you. You see, at Hope, our mission is to invite everyone to find Jesus and help them move to the center of God's purpose for their life. Well, I believe if we're gonna do that, if we're gonna move toward the center of his purpose, we're almost undoubtedly going to encounter moments just like this where you feel like you can't do it. And in those moments, I just wanna encourage you today, don't try to throw the dart. Don't try to be the one throwing the dart. You don't have to have all the talent. You don't have to have all the ability. You don't have to have the answers. You don't have to know how it's all going to work out. That's not our job. Our job, just like that guy said to me, is just to be the dart. To say, God, I'm in. Whatever you need from me, I'll do it. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. If you need me to go there, I'll go there. I'm in. And I don't need to be afraid because I know you control the outcome. And so I don't know what that looks like for you, anyone watching online. I don't know what that looks like in your context. Maybe it's a marriage and you're just at a point to where it's been hard and you feel like you can't do it anymore. Or maybe you're trying to raise a kid and it's been harder than you thought and it's not going how you expected. Or maybe you're a young person in the room and you have big dreams and you want to do great things, but you just don't know how you're going to get there. The message is the same. Don't try to throw the dart. Just be the dart. And if you do that, God will throw it and he'll hit the bullseye every time. Thank you guys so much. Hi. 
Hi, my name is Angelica, and I get the honor of leading our Seeds of Hope ministry here at Hope Fellowship. Seeds of Hope is a ministry intentionally and creatively designed to reach children living with special needs and their families. This ministry exists to provide an opportunity for children with special needs to learn about God's love in a way that is accessible to them. Our hope for this growing ministry is that kids would know that they belong and have a seat at our table. Luke 14, 12 through 14 says, Then he turned to his host. When you put on a luncheon or a banquet, he said, Do not invite your friends or your brothers or relatives or rich neighbors, for they will invite you back, and that will be your only reward. Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. We are called to serve without reciprocation. Jesus modeled this beautifully for us throughout Scripture. Studies show that 75% of the miracles that Jesus performed were on those living with disabilities. Jesus invested in these people. He intentionally paused for these people. The heartbeat of Hope Fellowship has always been, if people matter to God, that's right, they should matter to us. People who are imperfect, flawed, in need of a grace-filled and redemptive Savior. My dream is that we would understand that people living with special needs are no different than you and I. They're people, people humbly desiring to feel seen, wanted, and fully known, yet still abundantly loved. I don't know if you've ever felt lonely, left out, forgotten, maybe not invited to something you were hoping to get an invitation for. But imagine feeling that way all the time. Our society, and specifically the church, needs to embody a culture of more invitation and less judgment. If we're called to be the hands and feet of Jesus, it's time we vividly portray His heart and show unhindered love towards people living with needs that simply look different than ours. I believe the church is rising up and has been doing a good job at loving and accepting these families, but I know we can do better. In fact, I know this because statistics still show that 90% 90% of children living with special needs do not attend church. We all have our struggles on the weekend before actually arriving to church, arguments in the car and drivers who drive us crazy, kids who don't want to put clothes on, and breakfast plans that end up being large bowls of cereal because, well, that's life. In many ways, a family being impacted by special needs has beautiful aspects about it, but it isn't always that way. These families struggle equally as much, if not more, just to walk into the doors of a church. A huge reason of this is because although 90% of church-going special needs parents cite that the most helpful support was a welcoming attitude towards people with disabilities, only about 80% of those parents said that a welcoming attitude was actually present at their church. I know families who take two hours packing a medical bag for a one-hour service just so their child doesn't hit fatal levels at any point during the service. I also know families who have made it to the parking lot of the church but have had their child scream so loudly and punch and hit so hard that they never even got out of the car to come in. There are so many reasons why families turn around and just go back home, but with every ounce within me, I crave for their story to be different for there to be something that gives them the courage to just walk in. That's where you and I become the church. I need you to be the church with me. If you and I are to model Christ in welcoming the broken, sitting with the least of these, investing in the hurting, and seeking out the lonely, we need to live with hearts wide open and remind ourselves moment by moment of the classic phrase, what would Jesus do? Here at Hope, we're on mission to do our best in inviting families of children with special needs into the life and community of our church. To do this, it requires a posture of acceptance. And not just from me and my volunteer team, but once again from you too. You may be the face who shares a smile with a parent sitting next to you in service who feels alone and unnoticed, or the glimmer of hope to a parent who just received a heavy diagnosis. Or maybe you're the giver to a family who hasn't been able to pay a mortgage payment in months because of the pile of medical bills on their kitchen counter. Or maybe even without knowing, you could be the much needed ounce of joy that an exhausted and worn out parent might need to get through yet another day. I wanna encourage you that you don't need to have all the answers or the right words to say or even be serving in our Seeds of Hope ministry. What a lot of these families need to know is that they're invited in just as they are. 
They need to know that they can come and cry their way through worship, knowing the person next to them notices and it's covering them in prayer while the song continues to play. Maybe there's a single parent with no time for a social life to make friends, and they need to know that they have people here at Hope who will meet them where they are and embrace them. They need the church to be their family. Here at Hope, we recognize kids not as a child with a diagnosis, but as a child of God. This is how we see kids. We see them as loved and capable and worthy to be accepted. The needs that these kids live with do not define them, and it is our desire to instill these truths into the hearts of our kids who call Seeds of Hope home. All in all, hope is a better place because of these families, because children with special needs are walking into our doors and are finding hope, a place where they know they matter. Hey you guys, my name is Mary Solis. I am the Connections Pastor at our Frisco West Campus. And I just wanna share a few snapshots of my story, just in hopes that, you know, whoever you are, if you are retired, if you are in high school, if you are in a season of life where you're just working or you're a stay-at-home mom, whatever, whatever your story, that you would be encouraged to say yes to whatever it is that God might be asking you to do, whatever it is that's next for you. When I was in high school, I was 17, and I went to a youth camp, very similar to the youth camp that we send our middle schoolers and high schoolers to. And during youth camp, you would go to the front for worship and singing the songs. And so I went to the front, because that's what you do. And next to me was a girl, and she was worshiping in a way, like the best way I can describe is that either you're in here and you'd be like, oh my gosh, she's weird, and I need to leave. Or you'd be in here and you'd be like, yes, that's my jam. That's how I like to lift my hands and worship. And I don't know what it is. All I know is that she had something that I didn't have in that moment. And she wasn't just singing words on a screen. She wasn't raising her hands for the fun of it. She was singing to a person. And that person was Jesus. And I had heard of him. I even claimed to be a Christian, claimed to be a follower. But I did not know her the way that she did. And I could tell in that moment. And that's when my journey started, really, when I became, went from being a follower of Jesus to being a friend of Jesus. Fast forward, and I'm actually here at Hope Fellowship, and I'm 18 or so, and John is on the stage, and he's sharing the story of the cross. He's sharing the story of how Jesus died to pay for my sins, and I had heard it, you guys, for 18 years. Heard it over and over and over again, and maybe you're in here, and you've heard it 20 years, and you've heard it five years or your whole life. All I know is that that day, it was different. And something clicked in me and I realized that I was part of a bigger story that God had been writing since Genesis 1. I read in a devotional the other day that this is the drum that beats steadily from Genesis to Revelation. God is faithful. And now I realized that I was not just a, a pawn. I was part of a bigger story that God had been writing and that I, it wasn't based on my a talent. It wasn't based on what I could bring to the table. It wasn't based on my hard work. It wasn't based on my skills. It was based on one thing alone. God is faithful. And it would not, it would, he would be faithful not only to me, but to anybody, anybody who would say yes to him. And saying yes to him, that was like a totally new concept. I don't know about you, but like I'm a planner. I was 18, about to go to college. I had plans. I did not even think. I didn't even like think about asking God what his plans might be. And when I was at this stage of my life, I was like, okay, God, what, what, what might your plans be? I've got plans, but what might your plans be? And he said, go to Bible college. I'm calling you to be a pastor. I didn't know that I would sit on the porch in my dorm and have people that knew Jesus longer than me, knew the Bible better than me, laugh and joke about how women can't be pastors. And I, I can tell you like all the things like in my head, but I can't adequately explain the devastation that that would bring. Not just that, but the countless times after that, you guys, and maybe you recognize this in yourself, where I would wonder in doubt and Ask God, what about how I can't do this or I can't do that? And I would wonder, did he really say what I thought he said? And could someone like me really actually do something like that? My first few years in ministry, I had titles like coordinator and director and leader. And these were all like really incredible. Like I'm surprised that I even was like worthy to have those titles. But my response was one that maybe you would recognize. 
I said, I want to be everything to everyone, and I want to do everything better than everyone, and I'm going to work hard, and I'm going to be on time, and I'm going to be good with people, and I'm going to read your emails. That doesn't always happen. You're either good or you read your emails, but I had to be both, and all I knew was I was going to try and try and try, and I finally got to the point where I spoke two words, and these two words were the most freeing words and the most difficult words I could ever speak. I said, I can't. And suddenly then, I had gone from follower to friend, to friend to follower, back from follower to friend again. And it was the best decision I ever made. And I remembered that core belief that got me started in the first place. That I was part of a bigger story. And it would not be because of whatever I brought to the table. And you've got your things. I'm good at this. I could do this. I can do this. Fill in the blank. It would not be because of those things. But because of one thing and one thing alone. God is faithful, not just to me, not just to people called into ministry, not just to people who are special, to you, to any single one of you who would say yes to him. That's it. That's all it takes. No qualifications, no nothing. Just say yes to him. So wherever you're at, And whatever is next for you, whatever decision, if you're about to graduate, if you are in high school, if you are retired, whatever your story is, whatever your situation, say yes to him because he is so, so faithful. Thank you, guys. Well, hey, Hope Fellowship and all of our campuses, uh, Prosper, Frisco West, and McKinney, thank you for joining us today and to end your year. Um, Man, it is such an honor to be here. My name is Will. I'm over Hope Students, which is middle school and high school across all of our campuses. And I need you to know that I think Beef Jerky has a brilliant slogan. In fact, I think beef jerky's slogan is so brilliant that it is just like a little bit wasted on beef jerky. Although I do like beef jerky, a little expensive though. But I I, I think it's just a little bit wasted. Here, let me give it to you. You get out what you put in. You get out what you put in. Shouldn't that be like CrossFit or something with nutrition or something like that more than beef jerky? I've been obsessed with this uh, slogan for a few months now uh, because I think it is so simply brilliant that we'll get out of something what we put into it, right? We we get out of Christmas spirit, how much we put in. I'm still in Christmas mode. We, uh, the more that we pour into our savings, the more ready we'll be for a rainy day, right? The more time and attention we pour into our friends, our family, uh, the more we'll know them and understand the perspective that they're coming from. Uh, the, the more uh, fried chicken we pour into our body, the larger our love handles will be, right? We get out what we pour into it. And the, the people just a few steps behind us, whether by age or uh, spiritual maturity, or whatever that might be, they will get out of us what we pour into them. Not that we're better, not that we know everything that they don't know, but maybe there's a few things that, that we've already experienced, that we already know, that if we would pour back to the people just a few steps behind us, they wouldn't have to wait on experience to know what we know. They wouldn't have to go through what we've gone through to know how incredible God's redemption is. Like, they will get out of us what we pour into them. So the question for us today, for you and for me, is this, am I pouring into those a few steps behind me? Am I pouring into those a few steps behind me? I know this can be uh, frustrating and insecure for a couple different reasons. Uh, The first reason is sometimes it feels like you're pouring into porous cups, right? There there are whole, it's leaking everywhere. I'm pouring into this person and it is not staying, right? Time and time again. Like I work with middle school and high schoolers and so much of the time, it feels like you're pouring in. You're like, where'd it go? Is it somewhere I put all of my time, right? Uh, Or or maybe uh, I, I feel that way sometimes. And then other times I feel like I don't have very much to give. Like, I, I feel like I'm stretched. 
uh, in too many directions already, and, and maybe God is pulling me to pour into this person in a certain way, a, a young person, uh, a coworker, uh, someone in my neighborhood, and I, I'm like, I already feel stretched. I don't even have kids. I can't imagine. I literally can't imagine. Spent time with my nephew. I'm like, I love him. He's exhausting. Right? I love my nephew, though. He's real cute. And he's like, Santa. I'm like, that's right. Santa was here. Anyways, way off topic. <laughs> <laughs> so there'll be times that I feel like I, I just, I only have this little bit to give. And maybe I'll feel like, man, I'm, I, I feel empty. How do I have anything to give? And when I feel that way and when you feel that way, and not if, but when, I would love to, uh, I, I like to think of Paul's encouragement to the church in Corinth, which I believe is Jesus's encouragement to us today. He says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Another version says it is never done in vain. What we do for the Lord, in the Lord's name, for the Lord's glory, is never done in vain and it is never useless. So much of what has been said on this stage before is, is just circled around. There's this underlying tone of just obedience, just being available. And when you feel like you have nothing else to give, you have your availability to give to God. And what God can do with your availability is light years better than what we could ever do in our own strength and in our own time and in our own intention. Like Mary said, it was so freeing to just say, I can't, but God, you can and like Nate said, if, if we would just be the dart, I, I'm, God, I'm gonna stop controlling things and, and say like, this is my time for me to do stuff with, for what I want to do. And just say, God, I, I put my life in your hands. I put my time and my intention in your hands. And God, I know you'll hit the bullseye. And if we would do that, even at times, like when Reagan talked about, about going right towards a rock, like a rock, that sounds bad, but, right? I don't wanna crash. But if we would trust our guide and to pour into other people's lives, even when we're afraid that, man, maybe my, what if my advice messes it up, right? Don't you give disclaimers sometimes when you give advice? Well, this is what I would do. But hey, I don't know everything, just in case it doesn't go well. You know, like I told you, the disclaimer, right? Then we will be the people, like in, uh, uh, Angelica talked about, that would be welcoming to families at our church, in our neighborhoods, at our workspaces, in our schools, and so many other places, they feel like outcasts. But for us, we're gonna pour out and we're gonna give. Something really cool that, uh, that we've done over the last couple of weeks is I, I've sent out surveys to a lot of former students here at Hope, actually dating back all the way to 2012. It's just a short 10 question survey and uh, we, we're, we've gotten a bunch of those back and a correlation that I'm starting to find in there uh, is, is not necessarily surprising, but it's pretty cool reiterated in like a tangible form. Uh, a couple questions that we ask is, uh, one of them is w when you graduated, where did you feel like your relationship with God was? Where would you rate it? And then where would you, relate your, uh, where would you rate your relationship with God now? and it's between like a one and 10. And what I'm noticing is students who put, uh, rate themselves closer to Jesus now than when they graduated high school. Uh, I say students, a lot of those are adults and all of that stuff. Um, uh, most of those people name someone who poured into their life. They name someone, they name their small group, they name their small group leader. They mention someone who gave back to them. The last question that we ask is, is there anything else you would like us to know? I wanna read a couple of these, this is pretty cool. Hope Students is the reason I am the woman I am today. I now host a Bible study at my house with my soccer team, and there's no way I could have done that without leadership during my childhood years. I'm so thankful for hope, and it will forever have a part of my heart. Here's another one. Hope Students is where I found Jesus fell in love with youth ministry, and now I get to be a part of it alongside my husband. I'm truly grateful for every leader who poured into me. I value each of those leaders and can name all of them by name throughout my sixth to, to 12th grade years. Myself, Will Perry, I would not be the man that I am today if it wasn't for people who poured into me. Mark Hines, Matt Johnson, 
Peggy Norris, Clint Elder, Abel Sanchez, and countless other people who poured back into me, even at times when they felt like they didn't have very much to give. There's two people in this room and across all of our campuses, uh, probably the majority of us are feeling one of two ways. You're thinking of that person who poured back into you, who mentored you, who gave to you, spent time around you, who uh, was a mentor, a, you know, a, an incredible parent, a pastor. You're, you're thinking of that person and you, maybe some of you are already texting them right now. And then there's another group of us who might be thinking of that time when we wish we had someone. We wish we had someone that was pouring into us, even when we didn't ask for help, but we knew we needed it. For both of us, you can be that person. You can follow the example of those set before us, set before you. And you can be that person who you wish you had. You can pour into them. It doesn't matter if you're 13, 35, 92. It doesn't matter. There is someone a few steps behind you that you can pour into. So on your way in, we all got these little cups. And if you didn't, make sure you grab one on your way out. And I wanna ask this question, and then uh, what I hope that you would do today is just ponder this question, pray through this question. And as God gives you a name, that you would write that name on this little cup. You may recognize these from the dentist. <laughs> Floss more, all right. Here's a question. Who is Jesus leading me to pour into? Who is Jesus leading me to pour into? Let's pray. Jesus, who are you leading me and guiding me to pour into, to give back to? Because God, I'm available. Jesus, we are available. We're willing. And just as you are faithful, God, I pray that we, even in our weakness, even in our insecurities, God, that we would just be available for you, for everything that you have for us, and to pour out everything that you have for those around us. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.